What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Automate It. This is episode number six. I am joined, as always, by Kent and Pranav. What's going on, gentlemen? How are you? Amazing. How are you doing? I'm doing really good. The summer has arrived. You know, I've been complaining our last few episodes about no summer. It's finally here. It's above 75 degrees. The sun's been out for like three days in a row. It's mind blowing. Pranav, how you doing, buddy? Good. I just found my sunglasses as well in Seattle. Like nice. 80 degrees. Yeah. You plan to wear this and go out kayaking as soon as I, as we are done over here. Excellent. Amazing. You know, as you soon as I'm done. Boats. I know. I was going to say as soon as I'm done, I'm going to pick up the kids and, and we're going to go hit the boat and, and go out on the water too. So good day for it. Good day for it. Okay. So today in episode number six, Kent is back to teach us. And Kent, what are you bah, what are you talking about today? So today we're going to talk about a really important component of RPA solutions, and that's the gateway. And more specifically, we're going to talk about how to achieve high availability by clustering our on-premises data gateways. Okay, cool. And so the gateway, that's that's that piece of equipment that lets you connect to the cloud and your local environment, correct? Absolutely. So if you think about Power Automate, it's a, a cloud-based service. You go to uh, the maker portal, flow.microsoft.com, and you build out all of your automations. However, you need to be able to go ahead and run those automations. And when we talk about RPA, we're generally mimicking the actions that an end user would take. And so what we're going to do is connect down to their device. And that device can be on-premise. It can be in the public cloud, such as Azure. But we still need to go from this public SaaS space into a, a device that it belongs in one of your networks, your organization's network, and then have the RPA process run there. And the gateway helps us achieve that by being able to create a connection back to the cloud where we can then make requests through. Cool. So we get to use our local or, or our, our private space as cloud, right? We get to control it and connect it kind of in the same way. We extend the cloud. Extend it. Yes. Better, better word. Awesome. Okay, cool. Ken, go ahead and take it away, man. Show us what you got today. Okay, so just uh, a little bit about architecture. Uh, and this is and this is a shameless plug. This is some content from our RPA in a day content that was recently uh, released. So we'll include a, a link in the description to that blog post. But just wanted to give you a little sense of the architecture that I was talking about before. So naturally, on the left hand side here, we've got the flow or power automate maker portal. So flow.microsoft.com, where you go ahead and you would design all of your automations. Uh, we also have the Power Automate mobile app as well, um, but in this context, we're not going to we're not going to talk too much about it. Naturally, there's going to be a management plane where we've got management APIs that the Maker Portal actually goes ahead and uses, and we've got the Common Data Service or CDS that allows us to store our configuration for our flows. Now, some folks may know this, but for those that you may not, Power Automate itself, when we talk about automated flows, the runtime actually sits on top of Azure Logic Apps. And from there, we have the ability to use our large library of connectors in order to connect to SaaS applications. Now, what happens though, if we want to go ahead and connect to our RPA processes or our UI flows? Well, we need to be able to bridge that cloud world, that cloud space with on-premise networks and we can go ahead and do that through the on-premise data gateway. And that's the component here in the bottom right-hand corner. So this is a component that is shared across the Power Platform. If you've used Power BI, chances are you're using the on-premise data gateway. And same thing with Power Apps and Power Automate when we talk about making connections to a local data center. So for example, maybe you've got an on-premise SQL server, SharePoint server, or even a file share you would use the on-premise data gateway to connect to those systems. And we, when we build RPA solutions, leverage that same component itself. So that's good. So that means that people, I, I, I'm glad you said that. I was going to call it out. Uh, it's one gateway for all the services. That's a question I get a lot. Do I have to install multiple gateways for multiple different services? No, it's all managed through the same one, which, which makes it nice and handy. Yeah, the one caveat I would call out related to that is Power BI does have this notion of a personal gateway. And when we're talking about RPA here, we're talking about the enterprise gateway. So you want to make sure you're using the enterprise download of the of the gateway itself. Now, this is uh, in terms of scalability, which is naturally a question that comes up. Number one, how can I scale? 
but then also how can I absorb any sort of downtime that a machine might have when running this this gateway. And sometimes that's gonna be for legitimate purposes. So for example, you might have a proactive maintenance window where you do say Windows patching as a result of Patch Tuesday. And in the meantime, you don't wanna take all of your RPA processes down while that's happening. Well, using this approach of clustering gateways allows us to number one scale, but it also helps us to build a more resilient architecture as well. And that's gonna be part of the, the conversation today is how do we get more resiliency from our RPA solutions. Now, just a couple slides of how you would go about installing the gateway. So this is a pretty popular question we get. Whenever we talk about clusters in enterprise, there's naturally this question around like, well, do I need new infrastructure? Do I need like network load balancers or do I need active, passive and quorum disks and stuff like that? And the simple answer is no, no, we make this really simple. So when you go ahead and, and create a cluster gateway architecture, it's gonna be very simple. So you would go ahead and install the on-premise data gateway. You would register a new gateway on machine number one. You would provide a name, use a descriptive name that's easy to understand when later on you're building flows and you're trying to figure out, okay, what gateway do I wanna use? And then provide a recovery key. And this is just in the event you ever need to restore a gateway on another machine. Maybe you upgrade from like Windows 16, 2016 to Windows 2019 and you need to basically move your gateway to the new machine. So that's machine number one, quite straightforward. Machine number two is pretty similar. Um, there's gonna be one subtle difference. So once again, you would go through the installation process. You would wanna register a new gateway on this computer, give it a descriptive name. In this case, this is my second machine. So I've just added V2. And then what happens is I have a checkbox. And when I check this, add to an ex existing gateway cluster, as part of the dropdown, I will see any existing gateway clusters or gateways that already exist. And I can choose to join this one with that one. So in step number one for machine number one, we used ALM gateway. And what we're saying is join ALM gateway V2 to this gateway itself, and then go ahead and use a, a recovery key for this specific gateway. Now, what happens is when we go ahead and create that cluster, we can actually view our gateways inside of the maker portal. We can also see it in the admin experience, but here we're now in maker portal. And we can go ahead and click on gateways and see, in this case, we've got one called ALM gateway. And we can see that the, the status is online. And then we can also see other machines that participate in this gateway cluster. So in this case, we see our ALM gateway, which has the, the clustered image. And then we have our secondary machine which is our ALM gateway V2. And so that's how we can see that this is actually a cluster, not just a single instance. When we look at the UI flow runs here, this is gonna be all of the history for traffic that has moved through this gateway cluster. And so we can see you know, when we've got a, an RPA process in process, when it succeeded, or if we've got failures, we'll see that in this experience as well. Now there's one little feature here that I, that I haven't talked about on the previous experience and that's the run on all gateways in cluster. And so by default, when we choose to cluster a gateway, the selection of a gateway at runtime will occur, it's a random algorithm. Um, so it's not overly predictable in terms of how the load gets distributed across the nodes that exist in the cluster. And one thing I'll add here is we're talking about like a two node cluster here, but we could certainly extend it and add even more than two machines to the cluster. Now, when we toggle this switch on, so the run on all gateways in cluster, this will distribute the UI flows runs on the gateway, and we will be able to do that in a load balanced fashion in order to go ahead and do that. And so that's just an important, uh, an important feature that, that you, I wanted to call out and just uh, so that you can achieve load balancing. Now, the other thing that I want to call out here is, and this is in this note box, is that while a gateway cluster will avoid, you know, downtime by having multiple nodes available to process your workload, when you have an offline gateway, there will be a negative impact to performance. So it's something that you can deal with on a temporary basis, but it's not something that you should just leave. Like if you lose a node, um, leaving it registered, you would want to go ahead and clean that up if that is not going to be available longer term. So I just wanted to go ahead and call that out. 
Now, two demos I wanted to show today. One is a load distribution across two nodes. And so this is a pretty simple example where I'm just going to go ahead and kick off a UI flow process. And we're going to see that it gets the, the load gets distributed across two nodes. And we'll see that we're going to just going to simply open up a notepad file, drop a GUID in the file itself, and then go ahead and save it. And then demo number two is we're going to pull the plug. Uh, a scenario I think we've probably all wanted to do at some point is basically turn off uh, a server and then ensure that our RPA processes continue to go ahead and run. So with that said, let's jump into the demo. So just in terms of awesome. what's on my screen here, I have my VM number one, which is my ALM dev machine. And I've got VM number two, which is ALM build. And so these are both participating in that on-premises data gateway cluster. And then what I have is I have an automated flow that is going to go ahead and just call this UI flow. And the UI flow, as I mentioned, is extremely simple. I'm just going to go ahead and pass a GUID into it as an input, and it's going to go ahead and write that to a file that's going to land in this uh, C Windows demo folder. So now I can go ahead and kick this off, and I can just do so by clicking on the Run button. So we're just going to go ahead and click this a few times. And what we should see is that files do get created on both sides here. And let's click this just a few more times. So it's already the first one's kicked off on our second node. You know, Ken, you could have used a for loop. I could have, I could have, but it, 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 it was gonna take away the satisfaction of, of clicking, clicking the button here. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah, I know you're totally right. I was going to write a while loop, do while loop, and then I was just like, oh, well, let's just get this working. So as we can see, we've got processes that are running on both sides here. We've got Notepad on this VM. We've got Notepad going on this VM here. And you can see that we truly are distributing the load across both machines. And so naturally, this helps us process more orders, more invoices, more work orders, whatever the use case might be and we're centrally managing it from a single Power Automate flow, but distributing sort of the downstream processing across multiple nodes, which is, is obviously great as that allows you just to get more throughput and to solve a, a business problem faster or drive more value um, by having a central point, but then distributing that load out. So let's just let this last job finish here. And then what we'll go ahead and do is just turn off the machine itself. Let's just see how many are in process here. Uh, so we've got a few more a few more to go here. All right, so now we can see that all of our backlog has now been addressed and it's done. So let's go ahead and let's shut down this specific server. And it doesn't really matter which one we go ahead and shut down, but uh, we'll just go ahead and shut down our, our build server here. So that's now gone. And so what we should expect to be able to do is to just go ahead and click on the run button here and submit a few more uh, workloads. And we should see that they do get picked up on our dev machine. And that helps us deal with our high availability and ensuring that our business is able to continue to process workloads. And so that's how you can avoid those you know, outages or downtime when you do have things like planned maintenance for say Windows patching, or in the event that you've got some sort of catastrophic unplanned issue with a particular device or service as well. Awesome. So, Kent, a uh, couple quick questions. Are there any limits on this? How many uh, gateways can I cluster together? Do, is that something you know? So, not off the top of my head. Uh, I'm sure there's some sort of theoretical limits, and I would say that there's probably a need to go ahead and to uh, like break things down into like subclusters. Uh, I don't think that's really a term, but I would start to think about it as okay because you don't want to create a lot of competition across your other processes as well. So think about it, you maybe have like say five business units that have 
different RPAs running and you do want high availability. And so what you don't want to mix is say some of your high priority workloads with your low priority workloads, because at this point in time, they're going to get into a queue and you might see that some of the lower priority workloads actually sort of slip through and get processed itself. So I would take a step back and kind of look at logically grouping my RPA processes together and then figuring out what is the right cluster for that. So I might have a few different clusters with a few different nodes based on specific use cases. And I would try to logically group those together. Um, so that way you can still have high availability, but not run into issues where a lower priority workload conflicts with a higher priority workload. Got it. That makes sense. Okay. Uh, one other question. Uh, for these gateways, can I cluster VMs and physical machines together in the same cluster? Or do I need to cluster physical machines with physical machines and VMs with VMs? Oh, yeah. No. So there's no there's no dependency on on sort of the hardware that's that's running the operating system. So in this case, like it could have been a my laptop. I could have had my laptop as part of this cluster. And I could have had a VM in Azure as part of this cluster, and it wouldn't really matter. There's no, there's no dependencies from that perspective. And that's another thing that does happen with, um, you know, when you do build clusters for say like databases and stuff like that, is you generally have to like match your processing powers like like for like. Yeah. If that's not something that has to match, obviously you want to keep things fairly consistent, um, just to have like optimal performance. But there's it's not like you're going to go, oh, like this won't install because you have like 16 gigs of RAM on one machine and, you know, 24 gigs of RAM on the other machine. But consistency is good, but not something that you have to be overly concerned with. Okay, great. Awesome. That's all the questions I had. Pranav, how about you? Uh, no, this is great. Like, uh, this is exactly what we did with one of our customers where they had a flow with three different UI flows and we set up these different, three different sub clusters. Uh, and it's a good, it's a good takeaway over here is uh, you want to think about how you, you are prioritizing your your workloads and then figuring out this whole uh, subcluster strategy uh, as a way to evenly distribute your load across those jobs. Um, cool. Yeah, clusters right. are a, a big part of any deployment, right? So if it's something where you want to be doing some planning up front. And really sort of thinking about what your topology looks like so that uh, when you start to run uh, it's very predictable and something that you can test out in advance as well so very something very important that we do run into a lot as, as pranav mentioned cool okay so i love how we've invented a new word today subclustering yeah. so everyone go and take that on you're now going to think about subclustering your gateways uh, this is great. I think uh, the, the tips on trying to think about how you are managing the priority of your workloads is, is a huge takeaway from this and thinking that through. And then just seeing it in action, how we could you know remove one of those servers and it still goes ahead and does everything it needs to do, just grants some some greater security to people for people to see, oh, look at this. like this this is still going to run no matter what we throw at it. So, so awesome. one, other, one other thing just to add uh, that's that's really important is so when you go ahead and you establish a connection, um, you're going to provide a, a user account for that connection. So it's very important that whatever credentials you configure in that connection has the appropriate access to all of your nodes within your cluster. And so oftentimes that's like a domain join account, which is the preferred model but you need to make sure that it has the right level of access on each node so that when it say starts to run on node two, it doesn't go, oh, I don't have access to like that file folder. Uh, so ensure that you've, you're mirroring the permissions for that account on any nodes just to make sure that it's once again, very consistent. Man, way to save that very important nugget for right at the end. <laughs> well, no, it did hit me because it is it is truly important. <laughs> All right. So for those of you who watched to the very end, congratulations. You want a bonus. <laughs> Kent Pranav, thank you as always for joining me this week on Automate It. Looking forward to next week when Pranav is back up to teach again. You guys know what to do at home. Click like, click subscribe so that you don't miss another episode. And we will see you in the next one.